morning to you and welcome to Christ the King. Great to be with you this morning as we gather together on the Lord's Day uh, to worship Him. Let's stand together now and do just that as we use these words from Revelation 7 as God through His Word calls us into His presence to worship and glorify Him. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. 
Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. Oh, Father, we do enter into this time of worship this morning, knowing and trusting that as we gather together in your name, under the authority of your word, partaking of a foretaste of the wedding feast that awaits us when our Savior returns, that the veil between heaven and earth is stretched thin, and that we are joining the great cloud of witnesses who have gone before us in joyful adoration of all that you are, of all that you have done, of all that you are doing as Savior and Lord. Would you be gracious to us in this time, O God, that as we join the worship of heaven, that you would shape and form us to be agents of your kingdom, that your kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. We pray that you would do that work in us even now as we join our varied voices together as one, praying these words. All glory and honor be unto you, Lord God Almighty, for in your sovereign and gracious design, you have not left us to ourselves, but have adopted us as your own and called us to be a new people for your service, that we, the church for whom Christ died, might be a holy nation. So work within us this day that we might genuinely declare in our words and deeds the praise of your glorious grace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now, those who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, who have placed your trust and your faith in Him, what is it that you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Please do move towards the center. Take up any of those random chairs that are uh, in between you. You know, sometimes we pray the Lord's Prayer that uh, the Lord's kingdom would be made manifest on earth just as it is in heaven. And in heaven, you'll sit directly next to your neighbor. And here in worship, we can practice that uh, even now and make room for, uh, for those who are not yet here. So, yes, let the kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. And... Let's turn now uh, to our Lord and pray together. O Lord Jesus, great David's greater son, you are the Lord's anointed. You're the king and ruler over all things. Yet you are also near to us and we pray that you would now intercede for us as we make our requests not in our own names, but in your name alone. We pray this morning for our longtime mission partners, David and Eowyn Stoddard, and the entire Stoddard family in Germany. We pray that you would grant David wisdom and a shepherd's heart as he continues to serve as mission to the world's European director. We also pray that you would establish the work of their hands as they transition to Munich from Berlin to support a new church plant, and as David teaches at Martin Bucer Seminary. We pray that through this work you would raise up pastors and church planters from Germany that would spread the gospel, the good news, testifying to the truth of the resurrection and the lordship of our Savior. You are the creator and the sustainer of life, O God, and we thank and praise you for the birth this week of John Dale to Alex and Blake Berkey. Would you please bless this family, O Lord? And would you even now be at work in J.D.'s heart and his life that he would never know a day where he does not worship you as his Savior and Lord. Father, we pray for those in our church who are weary and heavy laden. We pray that you would give them rest. We pray for those who mourn that you would comfort them. We pray for those who are suffering from physical and mental illness that you would bring healing. We pray for those facing the unknown, that you would provide them wisdom and guidance. We pray for those searching for work, that you would provide employment. We pray for those who are single and long to be married, that you would provide them the desires of their hearts. And in all things, O Lord, would you work in us patience and trust, knowing that you are not a cruel father, who gives stones when we ask for bread. But you're a gracious Father who gives us abundantly more than we can ever ask or imagine. And we trust that you hear us and we trust that you answer us in accordance with the working of all things for the good of your people, just as you promise. And so we ask these things in your name, O Jesus. Amen. Oh 
Bible, in many respects, begins with God speaking into the darkness, let there be light. And there was light. And the Apostle John, picking up on this theme at the very beginning of his gospel in John chapter 1, says, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness will not overcome it. And that light is Jesus. He shines that light into the world and the darkness of this world will not overcome it. And he also very personally shines that light into the darkness in our own hearts, in the darkness in our own lives. And he promises not just to show it to us, that we would be ashamed of it, but to heal us of it, to take it away, to cast our sin as far as the east is from the west and to remember it no more. That's why we have confession in our time of worship. So I'd ask you if you are able and would like to, you may kneel now on the kneelers that are in front of you. Take just a moment to still our hearts, then I'll lead us in this prayer. Let's pray together. Merciful God, You made us in your image with a mind to know you, a heart to love you, and a will to serve you. But our knowledge is imperfect, our love inconstant, our obedience incomplete. In your tender love, forgive us our sins. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Stand together now and hear these words of assurance of your salvation. The Lord blots out all your transgressions and will not remember your sins. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. Thank you. Please do turn to those around you and pass peace that is yours in Christ. Good morning to you and welcome to Christ the King. Uh, You may be seated if you haven't already done so. Children may be dismissed now to children's worship. This would be a great time to fill in any vacated seats uh, from our children who have gone to children's worship. And um, yeah, it's great to be with you. So excited to be together this morning for worship. If you're new to Christ the King, really warm welcome to you. We're really glad that you're here worshiping with us. If you're on the far left-hand side of any of the rows, Really appreciate if you'd take that pad and record your attendance, pass that all the way down to the end of the row that you are on. We'd love to know that you're here, whether you are a member who's been here a very long time or today's your very first day. Just a couple of announcements before we introduce to you a very special guest that we have this morning. The first uh, is that we would ask every person, or at least every family, let me every family, whether you are a visitor or a member, to make sure that you take one of the connection guides that is scattered about all over the building. There's some on this table, there's some at the welcome table. Uh, This not only tells you what's going on in the life of our church this upcoming ministry year, but it also gives you a pathway to get connected in the life of our church because you can actually register for all of these events within the connection guide. So it's really important that every family has at least one of these. So please do take that. And also I want to let you know or to remind you uh, of our schedule here in this building next Sunday. Next weekend, this upcoming weekend, is church camp weekend. So many of us will be uh, away at camp, but we will still be worshiping here in our sanctuary next Sunday. We will have one worship service at 10.30 a.m. where we'll all gather together uh, with no Sunday school. So that is the schedule on our campus next Sunday, September 1st. 10.30 a.m. worship service only and no Sunday school. So if you're not at church camp, I would love for you to to be with us here uh, as we worship here on Silver Road. Uh, Before we have our time for offering, I want to introduce to you Kim Dolloboy, who's our mission coordinator, 
who in turn has her own introduction to make. So, yes, Kim, thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Kim Dalboy or Dolabois, and I currently serve as Mission and Mercy Coordinator. My husband Ryan and our family have been attending Christ the King for the past 22 years, and I am so excited this morning to share with you how the Lord has been at work in our city and beyond through your tithes and offerings. Through the Lord's provision and your generosity and heart for this city, we currently support 15 ministries around Houston, 12 national partners, and 10 global missionaries. We've also started several of our own initiatives, outreach initiatives at Christ the King, as a way to engage our neighbors, serve our community, and use our building seven days a week. Our Made with Love Meals Ministry, please feel free to pick up a freezer meal this morning and share it with someone in your community this week. The freezer can be found between Main Street and the Great Hall. The Traveling Table, which we'll pick back up again in October, Hausman Reading and Teacher Appreciation, and our most recent, the Cornerstone After School Ministry, which is held here Monday through Friday at Christ the King. It's been a pure joy for our staff to see and to hear these students every day in our building. And it brings me even greater joy to see the parents walk up our stairs to pick up their kids as I think about just the amazing, incredible opportunity the Lord has given our church body to share the gospel with these families. Because of the amazing work that Cornerstone Family Ministries has been doing for many years, and Amanda will share a little bit more about that in just a minute, and our desire as a church to engage our community more, particularly Hausman Elementary School just a couple blocks north of us here, we felt like partnering with Cornerstone was the perfect fit. Now I'll turn it over to Amanda to share a little bit more about Cornerstone Family Ministries and the after school program. Thank you. Well, good morning. It's truly always such a privilege to get to visit with partner churches because often we're on the campus during the week and we don't get to see all of the faces that make this the beautiful place to be. So like Kim said, my name is Amanda. I have the privilege of being part of the Cornerstone team. And today, really what I wanna share is what I would call a God sighting. And so Cornerstone has served in this area of town for about 35 years through a whole host of programs. But today I'm gonna to focus on the after school program. So in 2020, what a time, we um, acquired this after school program that had been run for about a decade at Chapelwood. One of their locations had hosted this, um, this program. And I came on board, I'm a former teacher and have worked at my home church, Faith Bridge and Kids Ministry. And so did not know that the Lord was calling me to this, but I ended up here. And we started with 12 kids at the after school program. And I would say that almost 100% of the students we serve check some kind of at-risk box. So they come from a single parent household, they live below the line of poverty, they speak multiple languages, all of these things. And if I asked all of you to make a list of what is good for kids, our goal is to check as many of those boxes as possible. So nothing we do is complicated, but it's intentional. We want every kid to feel seen. We want to give them opportunities that they may not otherwise have. We want them to give, we want there to be consistent people that are pouring into them. And we want them to know the hope that changes everything, which is Jesus. So over the years that I've been on the Cornerstone team, we've kind of grown this program. And we were running into this problem where we were hitting our cap of students because I have a very strong stance on if we're going to say we're intentional, we can't serve 100 kids at one location intentionally. We need more locations. So we were running into this problem where it was full. And I would get these phone calls from parents in dire needs looking for an after school program and I would say, we're full, I'm so sorry. And so we, start, we started praying as a staff, like, okay, we don't know all the logistics, Cornerstone owns no property, we partner with local churches to utilize space that is otherwise empty. And we just started saying like, okay God, if this is your will, will you just show us the way? 
And I'm not kidding you, the God sighting is, within a few months of us starting to pray that prayer, Kim and Mary Elizabeth approached me and said, hey, we kind of have this on our heart that we think maybe we're supposed to start an after-school program. And it was like, oh my gosh, okay, this feels like this is the door we're supposed to walk through. And so for many months, we have been talking and praying and planning, and it is so exciting that for the first time in a couple of years, we have more students than we've ever served across our two locations, And we actually have spots that if a parent calls and says, I've heard such good things, or I'm going through a divorce and now I need a place for my kid after school, or they're really struggling at school and they need extra help, that our answer can be yes. So thank you. You're sitting in those chairs and you may not realize that you're part of that yes, but you are part of that yes. So when you're not here, I just want you to know that there are faces that are so happy to be here. Literally crying when their parents come pick them up because they're having so much fun. So thank you for being part of the God sighting and saying yes. You may not have even known you said yes, but you said yes. So thank you for that. Uh, Myself and Bree, one of our staff, is going to be here in the Great Hall after, and we would love to talk to you more about that and share more stories of the actual kids that were um, impacting. But thank you for the opportunity to share what, what we've been up to. Thank you so much, Amanda, for being here. We're so glad you're here this morning. And yeah. And we're really, really excited to have y'all on our campus this year, so thanks for being here. Let's pray together now. Father, we do thank you uh, for all of the good work that you are doing in our city. We're thankful for Cornerstone Family Ministries. We are thankful for the love that they have for the children of Spring Branch, uh, for their desire, Father, to provide for them safe places, uh, places to learn, and places to learn about you. And places to simply have fun and enjoy one another and enjoy your creation. We're thankful that we can be a really small part of that here at Christ the King. Uh, And we pray your deep and rich blessing upon this program this year and into the future. And Father, now as we uh, give back to you uh, a portion of of what you have so lavishly uh, blessed us with individually, this is an act of worship, Father, to give back what is already yours and we pray that you would take it and that you would use it father for uh, gospel ministry uh, in our city and world and we ask it in Jesus name amen what a fellowship what a joy divine leaning on the everlasting what a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all. What have 
have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms And I have blessed peace with my Lord so near Leaning on the everlasting Thank you, Joe. Welcome everyone to Christ the King. I'm John Trapp, one of the pastors here. Really glad to have you with us. Uh, We are in our second week of um, studying the book of Ephesians. If you wanna turn there in your Bibles, you'll find us on page 976 in the Black Bibles in front of you. If you don't own a Bible or if you need a new one, we would love for you to take that Bible home with you as our gift to you. Um, We'll be in Ephesians 1 and I'm gonna start in verse 3. We'll go through verse 11. Let's hear God's word together now. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. This is the word of the Lord. Please pray with me. Father, we give you thanks for this word and we ask that you would help us, help us now to see uh, just how good this word is. Help us to see our need for this good word because of our sin, because of our our poverty and our souls. And we pray that, Lord, in, in that poverty and that in our guilt and sin, you would help us to see the riches of your grace that is offered to any who come to you for salvation in Christ. And so we ask this in his name that you would help us now through your spirit. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So uh, many of you all know the, the Trap family. We have, we have five kids in our, in our family and there's a uh, this kind of tradition we didn't mean to start, but that has begun with pretty much all of our kids' birthday parties, especially our younger ones, we've begun doing um, scavenger hunts. And they love these scavenger hunts. And I think one of the reasons that they enjoy it so much is that we've, we've begun not just doing like a scavenger hunt, but there's always a story connected to the scavenger hunt. They're more like kind of mysteries. And we realize our kids, our kids love being part of a mystery. And so usually the mystery... Usually I'm the bad guy in the mystery, okay? And there'll be, there'll be a video that they watch and they see the bad guy doing bad things. Uh, two weeks ago, I was the schoolmaster trying to take over their school. Um, I've been Carl DeVille, Cruella's weird brother, um, who stole their puppy that they had to find. Um, even for the younger ones, so I wasn't so scary. I was, I was Winnie the Pooh one time, you know, 
just a bear, a very little brain. Um, and they, there's something, though, that, that pulls them in when they're part of the story, when we're part of the mystery. And I think all mysteries do this for us. It's why we love mysteries. It's why we, we listen to true crime podcasts. It's why we watch mystery TV shows. It's why we watch thrillers where we don't know who did it in movies. We're drawn into mysteries because I think in a sense we get to interact with the mystery. We get to be part of it even as we try to figure out what's going on in this mystery. And what Paul's saying here in Ephesians to this church in Ephesus is that you're part of a mystery. You've been pulled into this mystery. And he tells us what this mystery is about in Ephesians 1. And by knowing the purpose of this mystery, we can more faithfully live in the tension of this mystery. So three points for you today about this mystery. First, the mysterious plan. Second, the mysterious purpose. The mystery's purpose, sorry. The mysterious plan, the mystery's purpose, and then so what? So the mysterious plan, Paul tells the Ephesians church in verse four that God chose us in him before the foundation of the world. And Paul describes this choice that God has made before the foundation of the world as being predestined. Meaning someone, before they are born, before someone seeks out God, God chooses to seek them out. Not because they are particularly good, but because God is particularly gracious. Paul is saying that the Ephesian Christians, and that really all Christians, are Christians because God has decided to rescue them. He adopted them. He loved them. And and this stirs a very mysterious question up in us, which is why? Why would he choose to do this? Why would God predestine some for adoption, as he says here in Ephesians 1? Predestination, it's, it's the stuff of late night college dorm debates, isn't it? Or like youth group van ride discussions. We've all, or many of us maybe have been there. If you haven't, um, that might happen to you today from this sermon. I want to make a couple of clarifications as we talk about this deep mystery, though. First... I want to be clear that that being right about predestination doesn't save you. You're not not saved by having 100% correct theology. In fact, I'm 100% sure, the only thing I'm 100% sure about my theology is that I'm wrong about something. That's the only thing I'm 100% sure about my theology is that there's something that I'm wrong about because I'm human. So I know that I will be, I'll be wrong about something. We aren't saved, though, by our flawless theology. We're saved by Jesus. Jesus is not a set of theological truths. Jesus is a person. And because of who Jesus is, it is good and right to be as theologically accurate about him as possible. By knowing somebody, we can really honor them and correct theology glorifies God. If you know someone, if you love somebody, you want to know more about them, and this brings them honor. And good theology helps us see the beauty of who God is and what he's done through Jesus. Thinking biblically about predestination does this as well. It helps us to see the glory and the love of God. Second point of clarification, while flawless theology can't save you, bad theology can damn you. It can. Because bad theology can lead you to place your faith in something besides Jesus. And Jesus tells us that he is the way, the truth, and the life that no one comes to the Father except through him, John 14, 6. We are saved by Jesus and Jesus alone. And I want you to know that there will be people who disagreed about predestination in this life who share eternity together with Jesus, okay? Okay. So this, is not, this is not a, hey, let's, let's spend some time talking about predestination so we can beat up uh, our Christ, other Christian friends and like humiliate them and out-argue them, okay? Because we will spend eternity with people who disagree with us on this. Uh, R.C. Sproul, who's a theologian who would certainly be on the side of predestination, the kind of Presbyterian reformed view of predestination, was asked a question one time about Billy Graham, who um, many of you know is a well-known pastor, Uh, evangelist uh, who would have been on the other side of the argument from Dr. Sproul. The question that he was, that Dr. Sproul was asked is, do you think you'll see Billy Graham in heaven? 
Sproul's provocative answer was no. I don't think I will see Billy Graham in heaven. Billy Graham will be so close to the throne of God and I will be so far away from the throne of God that I will be lucky to even get a glimpse of him. I love the humility of that perspective. A reminder that we aren't saved by our perfect theology, but by our perfect savior. So then why talk about predestination? Well, for one thing, it's in the Bible. And we like to talk about and learn about things in the Bible because we think God's given it to us for our good, to better know who he is. And Paul is not backing down from talking about predestination in this passage. He talks about it by name twice in verse 5 and 11, but even he talks about the concept around it in verses 4. God chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Verse 9, God made known to us the mystery of his will. Verse 10, God had a plan for the fullness of time. So we certainly need to talk about this if it's in the scriptures, but we need to approach this with care. This doctrine is like a scalpel. A scalpel handled carelessly or foolishly can leave others deeply wounded and people have been deeply wounded by by folks kind of wielding predestination like a scalpel and trying to cut somebody up. But a scalpel handled carefully by a surgeon can be one of the most life-giving blessings a person can experience. Removing the infection, infection and giving life and this teaching from the Bible gives life. How does it give life? Well, first it reveals the grandeur of God's love and mercy and grace. Verse five, it's in love that he predestined us for adoption. It was out of God's great love that he did this, that he moved toward us in grace and forgiveness. Predestination is revealing the most radical love you can possibly imagine, that when you were God's enemy, when you had done nothing to move toward him, when you had done nothing to merit his favor, when you would have willfully rejected him, he decided that he would save you. Now, a common rebuttal to this is that doesn't sound very loving to me. In fact, that that sounds awful because you're saying God didn't choose some. And, and, And what about all these people who are going to hell that he didn't choose? And I, I understand that rebuttal. I have felt that. I'll tell you, I especially feel that as there are people who I dearly love in my family that I desperately want to know Jesus. Friends, the problem with this rebuttal is that it assumes that there are people who deserve heaven. It assumes that there are people who deserve heaven. We'll get this in, in, in just a few weeks when we study more closely Ephesians 2, but Paul begins Ephesians 2, 1 saying, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked. In other words, every, every single person shows up spiritually dead, unable. Can a dead person save themselves? Of course not. We are unable to rescue ourselves, Paul is saying. Justin Martyr, just so you know, this isn't like a new idea. <laughs> Justin Martyr is a Christian in the second century, 150 AD. He, he put it this way. Of ourselves, it is impossible to enter the kingdom of God. Left to ourselves, it is impossible to enter God's kingdom. Adam, he goes on, Adam has convicted us of the impossibility of our nature to obtain life. He says, free will has destroyed us. We who were free have become slaves. Being pressed down by our sins, we cannot move upward toward God. We are like birds who have wings, but are unable to fly. That is a common rebuttal. What about free will? But do you hear what Justin Martyr says here? If God leaves us to our free will, we will never choose him. He says, we who were free have become slaves, like birds with wings unable to fly. In other words, yeah, we have a will, but if God leaves us to our will, we'll never choose him. That will cannot lift us to God. Our wings have been clipped by sin. It's why Paul says later in Romans 3.10, no one seeks for God. So if no one seeks for God, how then can anyone be saved? 
And it's the hope that God seeks after people to rescue them. Another common rebuttal is, why doesn't God save everyone? If God God can save anyone, why doesn't he save everyone? And my answer to that is, I don't know. I wish I knew, I don't know. That's a mystery. I'll repeat what what um, an old theologian once said about that question, which is, where God has shut his holy mouth, I will not open mine. Will not open mine where God has has shut his holy mouth. But the real question we should ask is this. It's It's not why doesn't God save everyone, it's why does God save anyone? That's the mystery because absolutely no one deserves it. Think of it this way. Uh, In 2009, Dr. Chuck Sandstrom, uh, there's a a story written about him in 2009, he was going to uh, a property that he had bought and was renting out to make some extra income. So Dr. Chuck goes up to his property, he sees that there is an unregistered car illegally parked in front of his building, and so he calls a tow truck. As he's waiting for the tow truck to arrive, the owner of that unregistered vehicle that was illegally parked, Michael Ayers, sees that the truck is about to be towed and in a drunken rage comes upon Dr. Chuck and hits him in the face so hard as his head hit a brick wall behind him, Dr. Chuck was knocked, almost, almost died. He was knocked into a coma for six weeks. He woke up uh, having experienced a traumatic brain injury, unable to speak. He says this about his experience. Because of the attack, I lost what many would call everything. I lost my job, my new home, a property, a social standing. My free-spirited wife now became a -a 24-hour-a-day caregiver. Recovery has been a slow and difficult journey our hearts were broken wide open. We have become the outsiders to the mainstream life that we had known. And so when the day of the trial to convict Michael Ayers came, the prosecution was shocked to discover that two of the witnesses for the defense of Michael Ayers was Dr. Chuck and his wife, Auburn. Dr. Chuck and his wife pleading to the judge to minimize the sentencing on Michael Ayers. See, they had reached out to the Ayers family. They'd gotten to know the Ayers family. They had forgiven Michael. They had gotten to know Michael's son, who was a third grade boy who was in despair over what had happened to his father, who was flunking the third grade. They'd begun tutoring Michael Ayers Jr. to care for him. They'd forgiven him. It's all grace. All grace. Probably not a surprise that these were people who had experienced grace. Chuck and his wife. Who'd experienced the grace of Jesus who were now extending that same grace that they had received. But I I want you to imagine now, imagine that there were two attackers, two people that attacked. And now imagine that when the the prosecution began that, that the Sandstroms only asked for Michael Ayer's forgiveness. They, they only asked for his sentence to be lessened. Would you leave that courtroom thinking, those people are monsters? How, how dare they seek Michael Ayer's forgiveness and not that other man? We wouldn't, we wouldn't leave that courtroom thinking they are monsters. We may leave the courtroom asking to ourselves, why didn't they extend forgiveness to both? And that is a fine question to ask. A question that you may not know the answer to. But the question that you would really be asking yourself wouldn't be why didn't they forgive both, but why did they forgive any? Because this man violently injured Dr. Chuck. Why would they forgive any? And the gospel of Jesus Christ is proclaiming that every single one of us, the wages of our sin is death. That we deserve eternal death and separation from God. That were God to leave us to our own will, that's what we would actually choose, to reject him. And yet, 
God displays his grace, his amazing grace by moving toward people who want nothing to do with him and extending his love and his adoption into his family by extending his grace. See, that's what this mystery is ultimately pointing us to, the amazing grace of God displayed through Jesus. The mystery's purpose, secondly, we see in this one massive sentence in the Greek New Testament, verse three through 14, it's one huge sentence. We've broken it up in our English translations into a few more, but it's one big sentence. And in this sentence, Paul is talking about this mysterious plan. And he talks about this mystery seven times in the book of Ephesians. Paul talks about this mystery and every time the mystery refers to the gospel of Jesus. That God would somehow love sinners, move towards sinners in grace, seek out sinners and save them through the costly blood of his son, Jesus. And so, friends, what this means for us, the purpose of this mystery is that we are called, verse six, to the praise of his glorious grace. To live in the praise of his glorious grace. This mystery reveals to us that our salvation is fully found in God from beginning to end. A common rebuttal that you hear about predestination is this sounds so proud. Like you think you're so special, you got chosen over others. This sounds so proud. But friends, nothing could be further from the truth because we aren't chosen because we're somehow better than others. This is true in the New Testament and in the Old Testament. When God chooses, when he elects Israel, In Deuteronomy 7, he makes it clear to them why he chose them. He said, you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. You were the fewest of all the peoples. God is saying, listen, I didn't choose you because you're you're great, because you're strong, because you're pretty, because you're better than others. You're actually really, really weak. But because you are mine, because you are my treasured possession, I have set my affection upon you. And and maybe you hear that and you're like, ugh, but like what about everybody else? Do you realize that the purpose for Israel, when God makes his his promise all the way back to Abraham in Genesis 12, I'm gonna bless you, your nation, so that through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Israel was going to get to participate in blessing everybody, blessing the world, blessing the cosmos. You see, this is what God does. He chooses us, but then he sends us out to be heralds of his grace so that others can be brought in. We get to participate in the mystery of others coming to know the goodness and the grace of Jesus. You see, one of the reasons that this doesn't sit well with us is that this means that God is the hero of our salvation and not us. He's the hero of it, not us. There's a hymn ironically named, I Sought the Lord. Listen to the first verse. I sought the Lord and afterward I knew he moved my soul to seek him, seeking me. In other words, this Christian is saying, I I thought I was seeking the Lord, but then afterwards I looked back and I realized it was him seeking me. It was not I that found, O Savior, true. No, I was found of thee. The writer is saying God is the hero. From the beginning, God is the hero. This humbles us. And in the end, God will be the hero. We see this at the end of this passage. That the goal of this mystery is that God made known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and on earth. One day, the full mystery of everything that God is doing will be made more clear to us. When Jesus returns, when heaven and earth are united, this gives us great hope in the face of trials. So we have humility on the front end because we didn't deserve it. We have hope in where we are going because God is the one who is bringing this to completion. So what do we do? Final point, so what? What do we do until Jesus returns? Some people, some people say, well, you know what? Your decisions don't matter at all. Whatever is fated to happen will happen. And that's one way you can misunderstand predestination. Well, God's, gonna, you know, God's chosen what he's gonna do, so he's just gonna do whatever he's gonna do, so I don't really matter. My decisions don't really matter. So why pray then? Why even share the gospel with somebody? Because you know, God's gonna save whoever he's going to save. Others might say, you know what, there is no fate. Your decisions will determine 
the life that you will have and the world we live in. Everything, in fact, is left to chance in your own determination, which, by the way, if we're honest, that's a very terrifying world to live in. Where God isn't in, where there no, there no, no one is in control of what's happening over history, where no one is in control of even what happens to our souls. If that's true, again, I would ask you, why pray? If God isn't going to choose to intervene into someone's life and to save someone, you can't really pray for God to be at work and to save your friends. Why pray? But the Bible, you see, the Bible has the most nuanced take of these two sides of like free will and kind of fatalistic determination. Because if you ask, is there a plan or do your decisions matter? The Bible says, yes. Yes. And you, I, there's so many examples of this. I'll, I'll give you one quick example. In Acts 27, uh, Paul is in this storm at sea and an angel visits him and says, no one's gonna die. You're, all, you're gonna make it. No one's gonna die. But then a few verses later, all of the sailors are, are about to abandon the ship and Paul says, if you abandon the ship, we're gonna die. Which is it? Yes. They stay on the ship and they live. Their decision to stay on the ship mattered. And God was at work. He was at work bringing his plan to completion. But what about good people? What about people who do good things? Don't they deserve heaven, you might ask? And I would say to you, only one man ever deserved heaven. Only one man. Only one man deserved heaven, and he was nailed to a cross by people who deserved heaven hell and as he died he prayed for their forgiveness he did and you know what 50 days later at Pentecost God answered that prayer of his son and Peter stood and preached the first Christian sermon to the people who had killed Jesus and in Acts 2 Peter says you killed the author of life this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Peter is saying, you're responsible. And it was all God's plan. And these people are cut to the heart and they ask, what do we do? And Peter says, repent. Repent meaning you have something to be sorry for for your actions, your actions mattered. And be baptized, he says, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. In other words, turn to the one whom you have offended. Turn to the the one whom you have wronged and you will find grace. God has a plan and God works through human decisions and actions to work out that plan. This means that we can be bold sharing our faith. Paul, who clearly is, like, he has something to say about predestination. And yet, that his, his belief in predestination that God is at work, it didn't keep him from sharing the gospel. Remember where he is as he's writing this? He's in prison because he's been sharing the gospel. He's the greatest missionary the Christian church has ever known. And he was willing to go to prison while he shared the gospel. Did he know who was saved and who wasn't and who God was going to choose for himself? And who he, it, No, Paul didn't. But that gave Paul confidence that there are some people, there's some people in Ephesus, there's people in Rome, there's people in Corinth, and I believe they belong to Jesus and God has brought me into the story of this mystery that he's going to unfold to save people and I get to be part of it. And friends, you do too. So let this make us bold. Let this make us foolish as we share the gospel with people at at like a C plus level, maybe not your A plus evangelism, but to do it with like like C plus or maybe even a D minus, but trusting that God can use my weak attempt because their hope isn't in me, it's in him and the spirit working in and through the testifying of his good news of his son, Jesus. And now the last question, which I, I would imagine someone in here is asking, the last rebuttal that you often hear about predestination is, well, what if I want to be saved and I'm not on the list? Please hear this from Jesus. From the lips of our Savior, Jesus says in John 6, write this down if that's a question that you've had before. Write down John 6, 37 through 39. And go back and read it yourself, but I'm gonna read it to you now to close. Jesus says, all that the Father gives me will come to me Hmm, that sounds like Ephesians 1. There's some that God has given to Jesus. 
He says, and all that the Father gives to me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. That means if you come to Jesus and want to be saved by Jesus, he will save you every time. You will not be cast out. And your desire to be saved is in itself a gift from God. That's what that means. Jesus goes on to say in verse 38, for I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Do you hear this? If you belong to Jesus, you're secure. If you, listen, I know some of you have loved ones who are losing their memory. And you may wonder to yourself, what happens when they forget Jesus? This is telling us that Jesus doesn't forget them. Some of you may have, have kids or grandkids who, who have left the church, who have wandered far off. Hear the words of our Savior, our good shepherd, who says, I leave the 99 to go after the one and call out and pray to him on their behalf, trusting that he will not lose any who belong to him. So let this embolden us to pray, to share our faith, and to thank him for giving us for giving us the faith to believe. He is the hero of our salvation. And if you don't yet know him, he will be the hero of yours. Come to him. He will not cast any out who come to him. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks. Thank you for your grace. Help us to believe. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, we now come to this table. This is a table that is for people who need to be reminded and who need to experience the grace of Jesus. This is not just Christ the King Presbyterian's table. This is the Lord Jesus' table. So whether you're a member of this church or any other church that proclaims the good news of Jesus, we welcome you to this table. If you are here and you haven't yet put your faith in Jesus, um, we're really glad you're here. We would welcome you either to come forward with your arms crossed so we know not to serve you the elements, but to pray for you. Or if you'd like, you can remain seated and consider all that you've heard. And I also wanna say, I'm, I'm guessing there's some questions that you may have after today. I get that, okay? I will be hanging out in Main Street just awkwardly standing by myself like I do some Sundays. Come and talk to me. I would, love, I would love to engage your questions and we might even set up like a coffee or something afterwards if it needs to be longer than like five minutes, okay? So please come find me out there. Friends, let's now come to this meal together. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let's give thanks to the Lord our God. Let's pray. Father, it is good and right to give you thanks and praise for this marvelous provision that you've given to us through your son, Jesus. Would you nourish us, body and soul, to follow him as we come to your table now, we ask in his name. Amen. On the night that he was betrayed after giving thanks, our Lord Jesus took bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he also took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant which is poured out in my blood for the remission of sins. Drink of it, all of you. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Therefore, let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. The gifts of God are for the people of God, so come and feed on them in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Jesus cast a look on me Give me sweet simplicity Make me poor and keep me Let me die
Sisters, let's lift our hands, our heads, and hearts and receive this blessing from the Lord. May he who by his incarnation gathered into one things earthly and heavenly fill you with the sweetness of inward peace and goodwill and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Thanks be to God. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow.